welcome to the 2017 annual public meeting of Physicians for National Health Program, Western Washington. We're into our second decade of existence as a chapter of PNHP. We'll be teenagers soon, watch out. There's no doubt about it, we are living in difficult times. There are many local, national, and worldwide problems facing us without either obvious solutions or the will to look for those that aren't obvious. In a way, it's comforting to try to shut out all the others and concentrate on one area, our area, bringing the U.S up to the standard of the rest of the developed world with universal, publicly funded, and guaranteed health coverage. Yeah. It may well be with the furor raised, uh, raised over attempts to repeal or gut the already insufficient Affordable Care Act that this can be the time to push successfully for moving beyond the ACA to real universal health coverage. Our focus th of, for this year's annual public meeting is healthcare activism now. We have two great speakers with quite a bit of experience with nonviolent activism to help us plan successful campaigns. So let's go. Everybody in. Nobody out. Medicare for all. Everybody in. Everybody in. Nobody out. Medicare for all. So the first uh, person is actually not on the program but has been added. It's David Loud, who uh, worked for many years as a chief staff person for Congressman Jim McDermott, who has recently retired. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I wasn't the chief staff person, and it was 10 years. <laughs> and as we speak tonight, Jim McDermott's in Adelaide, Australia, giving a seminar on American politics. <laughs> Can you hear me up in the back? Is this good? All right, thank you. I, so I worked for Jim for 10 years, as I said. I retired in 2015. And before working for Jim, I'd worked for 35 years in the healthcare industry as an activist with the goal of achieving a more just society and achieving healthcare as a human right. And I wanted to work for Jim because for many years, he had been one of the foremost champions of universal healthcare. Jim was the first person in his family to go to college. During the Vietnam War, he served as a psychiatrist, taking care of Marines and Navy corpsmen returning from combat with PTSD. This experience led him to abandon his dream of rising in the ranks of academic medicine, and instead to go into public service to pursue two main goals, preventing unnecessary wars and achieving health care for all. 1970, he won a seat as a representative of Washington's 43rd Legislative District, where we find ourselves tonight. <clears throat> and he was later elected to the State Senate and served for many years as Chair of Ways and Means until 1986, through 1986. In Olympia, Jim accomplished a lot for healthcare. Just a couple of examples. He successfully advocated for broad scopes of practice for advanced registered nurse practitioners, for physician's assistants, for dental hygienists, helping to create and build those programs at the University of Washington and elsewhere. He was also the prime mover in the creation of the Washington Basic Health Plan, which provided affordable and subsidized coverage for the unemployed and for workers without benefits. His hope was that this would be the kernel of a universal public plan. Jim was elected to the U.S. Congress in 1988 after spending a year in sub-Saharan Africa with the U.S. Foreign Service, where he witnessed the oncoming AIDS pandemic. In Congress, he quickly established the Congressional HIV AIDS Task Force 
and was a leader in the fight against this disease for the rest of his 27 years in Congress. Jim's accomplishments in Congress cover many areas, global health, African economic development, a crackdown on the so-called conflict minerals funding civil wars in the Congo, child welfare, enhanced unemployment benefits, environmental protection, protections, and much more. He vaulted to international attention in 2002 when he held a press conference in Jordan after visiting Iraq during President Bush's build-up to war. Jim stated that if Bush started a war over supposed weapons of mass destruction, it would be a war waged on false pretenses. He was derisively labeled Baghdad Jim, but he persisted as one of the most <clears throat> outspoken opponents of that war for its duration. Now back to healthcare. 1993, as looks like just about all of you will remember, <clears throat> Okay, <laughs> was supposed to be the year was supposed to be the year of healthcare reform under the new Clinton administration. That was when Jim introduced his single payer proposal, the American Health Security Act, HR 1200. This bill would establish a national tax funded plan with comprehensive benefits for all, including long term care. Each state would receive its share of the global budget and have to figure out how to deliver the mandated benefits. At that time, the Congressional Budget Office found that H.R. 1200 alone, among all the proposals thrown in the hopper that year, would cover everyone and would actually lower the nation's total expenditures on health care. Jim emerged as the leader of the single-payer movement in Congress and worked with advocacy groups all over the country. He then reintroduced H.R. 1200 in every session of Congress until he retired. He also co-sponsored John Conyers' Medicare for All bill, H.R. 676, in every session after it was first introduced in 2003. Jim was sorely and publicly disappointed when newly elected President Obama effectively took single payer off the table in 2009 before it was even discussed. As a senior member of Ways and Means and a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, Jim threw himself into trying to make what became the Affordable Care Act as progressive as possible. The considerably better House bill that he worked on <coughs> was watered down considerably in, Senate, in, in the conference with the Senate. And after the Affordable Care Act was passed into law in 2010, Jim's comment uh, e evoking the Allied invasion of Normandy was, well, now we're on the beaches. Jim did everything he could for the most progressive possible implementation of the ACA, <clears throat> and in Washington State, he engaged actively with advocacy groups and public agencies, and our implementation here has been one of the most successful in the country. Almost 800,000 Washingtonians have gained coverage reducing the uninsured rate to a historic low of less than 6%. But Jim knew full well that the ACA was flawed and only a beginning. And it would never cover everyone, nor would it solve the problems of cost and underinsurance. So he decided that national barriers to single payer were so formidable that the pathway would first have to go through the states, where there has, in fact, been considerable progress. In 2015, he introduced the State-Based Universal Health Care Act. This proposal would build on the ACA and give states all of the federal tools needed to build a universal public plan, including requiring all employers to participate. Jim was very happy that voters in Washington's 7th Congressional District, where we also are here, elected Pramila Jayapal after he announced his retirement last year. I personally cannot think of a better person equipped to build on Jim's legacy and to help lead the fights in Congress for social and economic justice and against war. But Pramila understands, as Jim did, that important legislative victories are only possible if there is mass grassroots pressure for change. As I heard Jim say many times in meetings and at public events, 
You have the power if you organize. So let's hear from Pramila now and let's get organized. Hello, I am Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, and I'm so proud to represent Washington's 7th District in the U.S. House of Representatives. I want to first thank you for all of the work that you do to serve the medical needs of people across our country, and also for your strong and necessary advocacy for a health care system that protects people and allows them to have affordable health care and live lives of dignity. I've been a strong advocate for single-payer health care because I think that health care must be treated as a right and not a privilege. The costs of health care in America are crippling families. I have heard too many stories of people who are just one health care crisis away from bankruptcy. I've heard too many stories of people who can't afford their life-saving pharmaceuticals or can't start businesses because they don't have health care. As an advocate, I was part of the coalition in our state seven years ago pushing for a single-payer health care system. Unfortunately, we didn't get that, but we did work very hard to get what we currently have, the Affordable Care Act. It was not perfect, and we have seen the very real work that we have to do to ensure that we continue to expand coverage for everyone and bring the cost of premiums, deductibles, and pharmaceuticals down so they're affordable for everyone. But the Republicans have been on a misguided rant for seven years, determined to destroy the Affordable Care Act and nowhere close to pushing for a single payer system. What we have seen now, though, is that the Affordable Care Act absolutely did expand health care for millions of people. In our home state of Washington, Medicaid expansion alone allowed for 600,000 people to get coverage they did not have before. Being a woman was no longer a pre-existing condition, and our uninsured rate in the state dropped by more than half. After voting over 60 times to repeal the Affordable Care Act and campaigning on a promise to repeal and replace it, Republicans and Trump could only come up with Trump Care, their misguided plan to strip 24 million Americans of their health care and transfer $1 trillion in tax cuts to the wealthiest even as Medicaid was cut by $880 billion. That is absolutely unacceptable. That does not move us forward, that moves us backwards. So let's be very clear that Trump care would make it harder for the elderly to get nursing home care. It would provide barriers for access for kids with asthma who need inhalers. It would revoke life-changing opioid treatment for those facing addiction, and it would put real people's lives at stake. Our collective organizing, resilience, common sense, and moral conscience stopped this inhumane bill from even coming up for a vote. We took to the streets, to the rallies, town halls, to the internet, and the floor of the House. From red states and blue states, people stood up to reject Trump care and all the damage it would do. And we won. We played great defense, and we must continue to do so even as Republicans continue to announce additional plans to try to allow states to opt out of the ACA, cut pre-existing conditions, and essential health benefits package. So we have to be vigilant, and we have to stay on defense. But we also must get on offense. It is simply not enough for us to be an opposition party, we must also be a proposition party. We must put forward the vision of the country we wish to see and the path to get there. Our progress and health as a nation depend on the ability for every single person to have access to health care that they can afford and rely on. On this front, a single payer or Medicare for all system begins to address some of what we must provide, affordable, quality health care for all. It's a simple and necessary proposition. And though some may say it's not possible or feasible, the truth is a single payer system has been successful in many parts of the world. Developed nations like Denmark, Sweden, and our neighbor to the north, Canada, all offer single payer health care to their citizens. That's why one of my first legislative actions was to sign on to Congressman Conyers' Expanded and Improved Medicare for All Act. 
As you all know, this legislation establishes the Medicare for All program to provide all individuals residing in the United States and U.S. territories with free health care that includes all medically necessary care such as primary care and prevention, dietary and nutritional therapies, prescription drugs, emergency care, long-term care, mental health services, dental services, and vision care. In addition, 10% of the bills in the few short months that I've been here and co-sponsored would actually improve our health care system. That's because health care is a priority for me. Health care should be a right for everyone, not a luxury for only those who are the wealthiest and can afford it. You all, as part of the Physicians for a National Health Program, have been at the forefront of the fight for universal health care. You've been educating health professionals about the benefits of a single-payer system, including fewer administrative costs and affording health insurance for the 50 million Americans who have none. Your work, combined with the voices of millions of Americans across the country, stopped the Republican health care proposal. And I have no doubt that whatever they propose next will be met with the same resistance. So keep at it, share your stories, stay engaged, let your voices be heard as we move on this path to single payer. Everything we do must be geared at making health care a right, not a privilege, and protecting the health and well-being of every single American. I believe if we fight for this in the streets, in the halls of Congress, in our communities, and our workplaces, we will succeed. And I plan to be right there with you on this fight every step of the way. Thank you. Next, I would like us to hear um, from students for a national health care, uh, for a national health program, otherwise known as SNAP. Um, we've had the program at the University of Washington now for um, three or four years. Um, and Simran? Um, uh, Simran Mand is uh, a current spokesman for that group. All right, how's everyone doing today? Can you all hear me? Yeah. There we go. Is that a little bit better? Yes. Okay, all right. So as Sherry said, uh, my name is Simran. I'm an undergrad here at the University of Washington. Um, a little bit of an introduction to myself. I am majoring in biochemistry uh, with a minor in bioethics, and I'm actually going to graduate this summer, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so as you can imagine, as a pre-med student, I'm a part of quite a few organizations here on campus, uh, other pre-med clubs, et cetera, et cetera, but the one that I most associate myself with is SNAP. And SNAP is Students for a National Health Program. We are the student uh, arm of Physicians for a National Health Program. And as you can imagine, just like PNHP advocates for a single-payer program, so do we. Um, here at the UW, though, we have a bit of a unique chapter. The first unique component of our chapter is that uh, we have realized that quite a few students here, both graduate and undergraduate, don't actually have a really good understanding of what our healthcare system looks like right now. And that's a bit of a problem. So one of our focuses here um, is that we want to educate students about healthcare policy. So we'll put on events like Policy 101s, we'll introduce them to, to what this, the landscape looks like now. And then from that, we will often talk about a single-payer system. And for everybody, probably 90, 95% of students, it seems like it's a very logical choice. Uh, they see the issues, we lay them out, and we let them decide for themselves uh, what, what it is that they want to do. Um, the second component of our chapter here is that uh, we believe in a, an effective campaign for single-payer will involve students that are not just going into the healthcare field. So not just nurses, physicians, and pharmacists, but also people who are going to go into business, people who are going to become lawyers, philosophers, sociologists, the whole nine yards. And so we actually have a concerted effort here on campus to reach out to students that are, let's say, going to law school, or students who are in the public health field. And we think that bringing together all these different forces, as we can see with the marches this weekend and on, and on the past weekends, the, quite the variety of people that we have out there, that having everybody together is, is the best way to move forward. And so on campus, we put on many events, Policy 101s, like I mentioned, to movie screenings and other sorts of events. And we coordinate our efforts, of course, with PNHP WW, um, David, Sherry, everyone else. Um, can we please give them a round of applause for all the help that they give us?
And so I'll close just by saying that um, over the next few months, we hope to grow. Um, I'll be applying to medical school this year, so I have one more year left, but we have plenty of other students that are uh, keen, to close, uh, keen to keep the fight going. Thank you. Thank you, Simran. Um, and I should mention that uh, Simran also finds the time to serve on the PNHP Western Washington Board, and we really value his work and his input. Uh, okay, well, now we get to our, uh, the meat of our program. We have um, uh, two speakers. Um, the first one is uh, Dr. Carol Paris. She is a recently retired psychiatrist, worked for more than 25 years in private practice, community mental health, prison psychiatry, and academia. In the course of her experience, she became an outspoken critic of the private insurance-based U.S. healthcare system. She is credited with identifying a new psychiatric epidemic, uh, P-I-I-S-D, pronounced PIST. Private insurance induced stress disorder. It's real. <laughs> After closing her practice, Carol worked for a year as a locum tenens psychiatrist in New Zealand and has experienced firsthand how much better a single national healthcare system can work, both for physicians and for patients. Dr. Paris was one of the Bacchus Eight. I would like to rename this group the Raucous Bacchus Caucus Eight, if I could get away with it. This group was arrested one at a time as they stood up in the gallery of the hearing room of the Senate Health Care Com Health Committee to protest the decision to exclude any discussion of a single payer plan in the run up to the Affordable Care Act in 2009. <laughs> yes. Dr. Paris was recently elected to a two-year term as president of PNHP, our national parent organization. She lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and her most recent activism event was appearing at a Trump rally there. You might remember a month or so ago, um, he had to just get out and have a rally. So he picked Nashville, that was his mistake. She unfurled a Medicare for All banner that she smuggled in up her sleeve and, and started chanting the slogan, Medicare for All, Medicare for All. She did draw attention from Mr. Trump, who said, I know what's going to be in the newspaper tomorrow, um, and then was escorted outside where she was interviewed by the media. Nicely done. Her friend Margaret Flowers describes Carol as a tireless, outspoken, and humorous activist. I can attest to all three adjectives, as Carol has visited in my home these past two days. Let's hear from her now. Would you open a bottle of water for me, please? Sure. Thank you, <laughs> if you can. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. It was such a treat to be invited by Sherry and, and David. And then when I heard that John Guyman was gonna be here, and then when I heard George Lakey was gonna be speaking, I would have walked here from Nashville if I had to. So, um, I am humorous, I think, and I'd like to tell you a, a little story because I think we have to control the narrative. We've got to stop reacting to things. It doesn't work. So we need to control the narrative. And I'm, I'm going to paraphrase one of my favorite poets who lives just down the road, I think, in, on White Island, um, David White. I mean, on. Uh, Whidbey Island. And what he, what I'm going to paraphrase is the um, end of one of his poems where he says, any narrative that doesn't bring you alive is too small for you. 
And I want to tell you about a narrative that was too small for me the day I was born. I have a twin, I have a twin brother, and the day we were born, and this was prior to Facebook and uh, Twitter and Instagram, just a few years, uh, my father sent a telegram to the family that said, the boy was a gentleman, he let the girl go first. I was the firstborn. I want to tell you that this is a narrative that did not bring me alive when I got old enough to understand what it implied. I'm sitting around waiting for my brother to say, oh, after you, my dear. I don't think so. In fact, I want to tell you I am absolutely taking control of the narrative, and here is what really happened. Because my father was not in the womb. My mother went into labor, and I said, out of my way, I have places to go, people to see, and things to do. And it hasn't changed much in the next 64 years. But that doesn't mean that I came out of the womb as a single-payer, Medicare-for-all, sign-holding activist. And I actually grew up in a, in a family that thought girls should marry doctors, not be doctors. So I had to work on that a little bit. And, um, and then I, I finished medical school as a, an older physician, older medical student. And I really was, in those days, we didn't learn a whole lot about um, the healthcare system. And I'm so glad to hear Simran saying that they understand it's important to learn what the system or lack of system is that we have so they can create something that's going to help, help them to become mid-career and late-career physicians who are not tired and angry and burned out. I will digress for a minute and tell you that the Surgeon General last year, his two biggest concerns were the opioid epidemic and physician burnout. So it's a real thing. But I thought, well, you know, when I finally got into a private practice and put on the business owner hat, as well as the physician hat, boy, were my eyes opened. And I thought, this is crazy. We've got to do something here. And I started working with the Maryland, I lived in Maryland, and I started working with the Maryland State Medical Society. And we passed a piece of legislation that silly, naive me thought actually was going to, in a small way, get the insurance companies to play fair. I said, naive. Two years later, guess who had written the regulations? The lobbyists for the private insurance industry. And it was at that point that I threw my hands up in disgust and said, there has got to be something better. And my friend said, well, have you met Margaret Flowers? And do you know anything about Physicians for a National Health Program? This was in December of 2008. And as you know, um, in 2009, Barack Obama became president. And I began a six-month mentorship with Mar Dr. Margaret Flowers. I would come home from work every night and just study, 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 read, read, read everything I could about healthcare reform so that I could understand, finally, it was like, a, you know, re remedial healthcare policy 101. And then it was, as Sherry pointed out, May of 2009, and uh, Margaret called me one evening and said, what are you doing on Thursday? I said, oh, I thought I was going to go to work, but what did you have in mind? And she said, well, how would you like to go to the Senate Finance Committee, and um, you might get arrested. <laughs> and I said, with you, Margaret? Sure, what the heck. So the way we worked this gig, and, and here's where I, I really want to make the point that if you're going to do activism, make it work. I don't do anything impulsively and born of passion. I do it for political theater, and I do it to get media 
and I do it to get a message out, build the movement, okay? So we were just learning in those days, but what we did was we made sure that all eight of us were in the middle of aisles, so it would take the Capitol Police a little longer to get to us, um, so we would have more time to say what we wanted to say. And of course, I had a like three-page um, epistle that I was going to say, and Margaret said, you know, Carol, I, I really don't think you're going to get to say that much. <sighs> so I ran to the bathroom where I do all my best thinking and came out and we, we started. So he, Max Baucus pounded the gavel and the first person got up and interrupted him and got arrested and taken off. And um, I was the fourth person. And, and by this time, you could tell that Senator Baucus was getting a bit peeved with these pesky people. And I decided I would use humor. So I, he finally got the group started again, and now it's my turn. And I stood up and I said, I interrupt this so-called public hearing to bring you the following unpaid political announcement. Put single payer on the table. My name is Dr. Carol Paris, and I approve this message. <laughs> the whole place burst out laughing, and then Grandma Carol, in her little black suit with her pearl necklace and little black pumps and gray hair, got arrested and ended up on the cover of Michael Moore's homepage, surrounded by Capitol policemen because it took at least five people to restrain me. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, six months later, when we were off probation, um, <laughs> the president uh, had his State of the Union address in January of 2010, where he said, if you have a better idea, let me know, let me know, let me know. Well, we decided we were going to let him know. And this time we learned something from the first experience, which was that we hadn't brought a videographer with us. And we had some pictures taken, so there was that. But we really missed out on the media opportunity, because of course we know that the mainstream media is not going to give us any airtime at all. Um, so this time we brought a videographer with us, and what we were planning to do was stand outside of the Harbor, um, Baltimore Renaissance Harbor Hotel as the president's motorcade drove by because he was going up to see, to visit, um, to meet with the Republican caucus. And so we pulled out our sign that said, letting you know, Medicare for all. And the security people came over from the hotel and said, uh, you ladies are trespassing, you have to you know, be nice little girls and go over there. And we said, but if we go over there, the president's not going to see our sign, and people are dying. We, we have a better idea, and we have to let the president know. He asked us to let him know. They were not impressed. So they sent over the Baltimore police. And, you know, here comes the Baltimore police, and we're supposed to be real scared. And uh, he says, you know, if you don't move over here, we're going to arrest you. And I said, well, you know, you do what you have to do, we'll do what we have to do. And I could see this guy was really frustrated. And I said to him, you know, this must be really frustrating for you. I'm a psychiatrist. <laughs> I can't help it. And he said, yes, it is. Would you just go over there? I said, I can't go over there. The president won't see us. And people are dying. We have a better idea. So then they thought, well, if the police aren't going to scare us, the Secret Service are definitely going to scare us. And here comes the Secret Service guy, and he said, go over there. We said, no, sir, we're not going over there. But we've got this letter for the president, and if you would deliver it to him, we'll go away. He said, I am not the Postal Service. <laughs> OK, well, we're not going over there. So they arrested us. And we unfortunately did not get to deliver our letter to the president. But what we did manage to do is have a complete videotape of the whole thing, which ended up being shown on Democracy Now! the next day, 
segments of it, which Bill Moyers of Bill Moyers and Company saw. And I came to work the next day and my office manager said, Dr. Paris, there's somebody from Bill Moyers on the phone. And they want to see if you would go to New York to be on the show. Um, either you or Dr. Flowers. And that was the point at which I said, oh, I'll be glad to tell them Margaret can go. <laughs> um, but the point I'm trying to make is activism is, direct action is, is what we need to be doing. And we need to do it strategically. I did not engage in direct action from 2010 until 2017, just last month, at the Trump rally. Because there really was not, it, it would not have served any useful purpose. I did do movement building um, in other ways. But, and I kept my eye on opportunities. And when the opportunity presented itself, and it seemed like I could get some, some additional um, cachet from it, I was willing to go ahead and, and engage in another direct action. And what that was, was standing in line at the Trump rally with Trump supporters for five and a half hours, um, which was really an interesting experience, and I'm so thankful for it. I sat, I stood with a woman and her daughter who said, you know, my husband couldn't be here. He so wanted to be here because he just, he so wanted to meet, to hear the president speak. But he has um, lung disease and he, it would be too hard for him to breathe. And so we talked about that and I shared that my father and mother both had passed away from various lung diseases and, and I know how sad it is to see somebody struggle for, for breath. And at that point I said, you know, I've got to go charge my phone. Would you keep my place in line? And I'm just going to run up the street and charge my phone. And they were like, oh, yeah, sure, fine, no problem. And then some um, Bible-thumping people with megaphones came walking by and shouted in our ears for, honestly, it felt like two hours. And all of us, me and all the Trump supporters, uh, wished that they would just go away. Um, so then... It's getting close to time to go in, and the protesters start walking by. And I've now been with these Tea Party Trump supporter people for five and a half hours. And when I saw some of the signs that people were carrying, I was offended. As something had happened to me in that five and a half hours of just being in another person's reality. And I was offended by the rude, un, just snarky, unkind signs. So my opinion, leave those kinds of signs out of your efforts for Medicare for All. Please do me that favor. It doesn't help. Make a sign about what you're for, not who or what you're against. It just doesn't serve any useful purpose. So when I did get in, um, I did have a uh, resident in vascular surgery who said, Carol, I really can't get arrested. I said, you don't have to get arrested. You don't have to do anything except catch this all on your flip phone, your, you know, your, um, your smartphone, and then upload it to Margaret Flowers in Baltimore as soon as I get either arrested or kicked out, um, and take my business cards over to the press table and distribute them. Because again, I am political theater from start to finish. I want to get as much press out of this as I can. And that's exactly what happened. Um, I stood in the first two rows, and I made sure that I was close enough that the president would be able to hear me if I shouted loudly enough. And the press table was right over there, and they had a good view of me as well. Um, and when the president started talking about health care reform, I pulled my sign out that said, improved Medicare for all. And I just held it over my head. And I said, put your name on a plan that works. 
Medicare for all. I didn't say, you're a jerk, you're a anything. I said, I've got an idea. Put your name on something you can be proud of. And I'll be proud of you if you do that. So I just kept saying it over and over again. Put your name on a plan that works, Medicare for all. And I was able to chant that enough times that the president actually did have to kind of stop what he was talking about um, and look over and kind of, you know, like, go away. And, and the Ch Trump supporters were told not to touch any protesters, which they did not, and to just shout Trump, 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 which they did do. And, and then I was escorted out and the video got uploaded to Margaret. The press box got my cards. I went outside. I wasn't arrested, so I got to talk to all the press outside before anybody else did. And on the way home, a reporter from the Tennessean was already calling me because Margaret Flowers had called him, and an article appeared in the paper the next day. So, again, I enjoy doing this kind of thing. It's a way that I can contribute to this movement that is fun and I enjoy doing it. Um, that isn't for everybody and goodness knows we need helpers and organizers. We need people who are organizing all the other things that have to happen to, to build a movement that I think I am so eager to hear George talk about because what I can say about PNHP is that um, I think we really need some help in broadening our strategy, in finding out what we need to do that's going to work. Because I love the, a lot of the sayings in AA, and one of them is, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. And PNHP has been giving um, PowerPoint slide presentations to physicians for 35 years. If policy and data was going to get us single payer, I think it would have by now. We need that. We absolutely need that. We're going to need it even more when we pass the legislation because we're going to need to do this right. So I'm going to just finish up by saying the other really exciting outcome that I think this latest action contributed to is that I live in Nashville, Tennessee, where Jim Cooper is my congressman. He's a blue dog Democrat. He has never co-sponsored H.R. 676. I met with him. I spoke to him at, the, um, at his one of his he didn't call them town halls, but something like a town hall. Um, and I asked him to co-sponsor, and he danced all around the subject. And then I said, well, I have an appointment with you in 10 days and uh, in your office. So I'm going to be talking to you about this some more. And in that intervening 10 days is when President Trump came to Nashville. So by the time I showed up in Jim's office, he said, weren't you scared? Uh, <laughs> and I said, well, sure, I was scared, but come on, I'm white, I'm 64 years old, I'm a woman, and I've got gray hair. I mean, who's really going to beat up Grandma Carol? Give me a break. So, yes, I was a little nervous about it, but again, it was a calculated risk. And then he started talking about health care reform, and we got around to what happened in 2009, and I said, well, yeah, I was one of the Bacchus eight, one of the people that got it. And he said, oh, so this wasn't your first rodeo. I said, no, sir, it wasn't. I'm really serious about this, and I'm not going away, and I live here. Yeah. Two weeks later, I had another appointment in his office on Good Friday, and he said, Carol, I'm co-sponsoring H.R. 676. He also said, 
this doesn't mean as much as you'd like it to mean. And I said, what do you mean, Jim? He said, you've got a lot of work to do. And I said, tell me, I really want to know. He said, you've got to get business on board, and you have got to get bipartisan support. You've got to get Republicans. I said, who should I start with? And he said, Charles Dunn of Pennsylvania. I said, yes, sir, I will start on that tomorrow. And we are working on it. I'm also happy to say that there is a new or a campaign that is being sponsored by the American Sustainable Business Council, and the campaign is called Business Leaders Transforming Healthcare. And the, it is, um, it's a campaign that's being started by Richard Master, who is the person who wrote the documentary Fix It and has now come up with a second one on the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and he is championing a national health program because he gets it from the business perspective. Healthcare as a human right is nice, but what really matters to him is that it's gonna save him a whole lot of money and allow him to provide really good health care for his employees who are going to show up for work more because they're healthier. Guess where he lives? Charles Dent's district. <laughs> so it's like, I, I don't know, I can get philosophical sometimes and it's just, I just feel like the universe is saying we're just gonna you just keep showing up Carol just keep doing the next thing that seems like the right thing to do and you don't have to know how it's gonna turn out I'm just gonna just keep showing up and it's just gonna keep moving in the right direction and I'm gonna finish by saying this is unstoppable and now is the time for Medicare for all thank you Is she a winner or what? Yes. Okay, um, we're going to take a little break before we have the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Guyman, come on up. Uh, we have an uh, award that we give every year that we've named the Dr. John Guyman Health Justice Advocate Award. And here's Dr. Guyman to present it. Thank you, Sarah, and I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere these days. Uh, and a, a few comments. It's an honor to have this award named after me. But, you know, we all come from our own heroes. And one of mine uh, way back is Quentin Young, uh, who chaired the Department of Medicine of Cook County for many, many years. He worked from the inside. He was a real activist got a lot done, uh, and uh, was the national coordinator of the national PNHP forever. He died about a year or two ago now, I guess, down in Berkeley. Uh, his book, if you have not read his book, Everybody In, Nobody Out, get that book. Very important, and it traces his life. Um, that's a memoir of uh, <laughs> a... Uh, advocate who never got tired uh, and uh, so anyhow it's an honor to uh, um, uh, find out who the awardee is this year and I'll get to that in a moment but first I'd like to second what um, we just heard that uh, Medicare for all could be this moment um, I spend, oh, I want to introduce my wife, Emily, to this group. Emily, could you stand up? Uh, uh, Emily is my wife of uh, 47 uh, months. We go on monthly uh, anniversaries these days. Uh, my wife of 56 years, Jean, died of Alzheimer's uh, in 2012. So, uh, but Emily, uh, is a great editor, 
Uh, she runs Eagle Eye Editing up in the San Juan Islands, and she's edited everything I've written since uh, we've been married. And uh, uh, <clears throat> lots of good ideas. And uh, on that, my latest book is out there, and uh, it's uh, uh, Crisis of U.S. Healthcare, Corporate Power Versus the Common Good. And uh, uh, just uh, to mention, I, I think our major problem, however we are activists, uh, and there are lots of roles and ways to do it, but basically you have to educate the public about what is Medicare for all and what are the problems of our system. More and more parts of the population know the problems firsthand and just hate it. Uh, so it's going to get easier, I think, to educate them. But. But, uh, but my thing is to write it down and connect the dots. And, but the experience I've had in, in spreading the word has been really pretty disappointing. I've had two previous books where the PNHP chapter in DC hand carried the books to 535 people in Congress, 100 in the Senate, 435 the House. The, the LAs, the legislative assistants, a big project, all donated. Uh, never one response, not one response. So, so the written word is hard to get out. Uh, what I'm doing right now, as a matter of fact, I just am finishing a, a pamphlet. I, I went back to um, um, uh, Thomas Paine's pamphlet about the revolution, which is 1775 and six. And actually that's the most read document in the America including up to 2006. And uh, so anyhow, I, I, I did a little thing of, which will be out soon. It's a little 28 page pamphlet. At my cost, it's $3 a pamphlet. I hope to have them all over the place. Uh, but it tries to, to, to break it down. It's got the same table of contents uh, 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 pattern-wise as the original one in 1776, etc. So, and, and his thing, Thomas Paine was, uh, uh, he developed his whole argument on, on uh, simple facts, plain arguments, and common sense. Hence the title of his, of his pamphlet. Uh, so anyhow, I think we all have to educate uh, the public, and if you look at politics of today, I think the GOP, having had their bill pulled twice, they don't have a clue. Uh, but with Dr. Price uh, as HHS head and administratively taking apart the ACA in the next couple years, whatever they do, they're going to make everything worse. And uh, so I think is, this is the moment. I think it's going to be a big deal in the 18 elections and the 20. Uh, so I think uh, uh, this is the time. Um, there are now 104 co-sponsors of H uh, HR 676. 108. 108. OK. I thought I was up to it, but that was yesterday. <laughs> OK. So anyhow. Uh, it's really great. Now, now, what you asked me to come up here is to, uh, <coughs> um, I gather, uh, invite the honoree of this year's award up. And I don't know if, if you know who it is. Uh, David told me you don't. So I'll, I'll let you guess a little bit. Uh, uh, he, he's been president of this group uh, for several years. He's been on the board for a number of years and advises the board. He's a retired pulmonologist. He went to Stanford Medical School. He's been a strong advocate of social justice for, for uh, all his career. So uh, Dr. Don Mitchell, where are you? Well, you've got to take this and say something. Well, thank you. Well, you can do it. <laughs> thank you very much. This is really an honor. One correction. I actually went to Stanford undergraduate, but to Harvard Medical School, but 
what's the difference, you know? <laughs> but at any rate, I really, this is a real honor uh, that uh, to be given this. Uh, I've been a little less active in the last year. I think this may be more active uh, in the coming year, and, but I appreciate it very much, and thank you very much. We have a little problem here. It, it's difficult. David will want to see you on it. And I left my cheat sheet. Okay, moving right along. Um, uh, David McClanahan is going to introduce our next guest speaker. So. It's a real extreme honor to introduce George Lakey. Uh, I've had extra honor in ha being with him for the past two days, and I want to give a shout out to Mike McCormick. I hope that many of you listened to the radio interview this morning in which George described the importance of being on the offense for social justice, which is really the whole reason the whole focus of uh, this weekend is that we need to be on the offense if we're going to get there to where we need to be. And that interview this morning is uh, videotaped by Mike and will be available. And I told George if he, he doesn't need to say anything other than exactly what he said this morning because it was so uh, exciting and uh, turning on <laughs> people. How many people saw it or heard it? Great, a bunch of you, but uh, it will be available, I think, Mike, maybe next week, but we'll uh, definitely blast it out there for you, along with another shout out to Mike of Mind Over Matters KEXP Radio, who is... <laughs> <laughs> who has interviewed our speakers over the last five, six, seven years, I don't remember, and made videotapes available to us, which uh, we can spread around the single payer community to PNHP National picks it up and uh, Mike is just such a wonderful thing. Now back to George. Now, uh, John mentioned a giant, uh, Quentin Young, the giant, the most respected person in healthcare uh, advocacy, social justice advocacy over the last 50 or 60 years. Now, and uh, Quentin spoke at two of our meetings. And that was really an honor. And, you know, Margaret Flowers spoke here too. And she's, you know, and Carol are the forefront of uh, uh, single payer uh, now. But uh, George, like Quentin, is a giant in the nonviolent resistance movement in the past 50 or 60 years in this country. And it's such an honor, and you'll, after you listen to him for five minutes, you'll agree that this was the best possible thing you could do tonight. George, uh, I first, you know, I'm sure I've read your stuff in the past, but recently I saw the article in Popular Resistance that Margaret Flowers puts out, and everybody should be on that email thing that comes out every day, popularresistance.org. Uh, a couple of George's uh, recent articles in uh, Waging Nonviolence, uh, an organization uh, that he writes regularly for, uh, is in, uh, two of them are included in the folder. And the one I saw was 10 points on how to resist Trump. And so you can take that home and uh, look it over and digest it. <laughs> uh, but in look, uh, looking a little bit at George's history, I found that there's some real interesting connections there. First of all, uh, he taught at Swarthmore, where three of the members of our board went, <laughs> Sherry, myself, and Seth uh, Armstrong over there. So there was that connection. And then when he was first year in college, he was like the editor of uh, that college newspaper, and he was such a trouble to the authorities that he was invited to leave there for being uh, such a radical who couldn't be controlled of what he was saying in the local newspaper. So he 
uh, enrolled in Cheney University, which is the, was an all-black college just outside of Philadelphia and very close to Swarthmore, and was the first graduate, white graduate of that black college. So the other connection is my dad, a few years later, got a, uh, a uh, master's degree in sociology there, you know, later in his life, having worked his whole life in the cooperative movement, and stayed at Cheney to teach for three or four years, and lived at Pendle Hill, the Quaker uh, place that George is, was, you know, is closely associated with. Now, George, after leaving Cheney, became uh, involved in the civil rights movement in the South, which was very heated up at that time in the early 60s, and uh, it got involved in training white students to go down and support their, their black brothers and sisters, putting their lives on the line to fight the evil that was going on there, and developed a training manual that was used uh, throughout that time period. His first arrest was at, at a sit-in, uh, for civil rights causes. A couple of years later, in 1967, I think it was, he was on a boat, the Phoenix, that took medical supplies to Buddhists in Vietnam who were, you know, the authorities there didn't like what they were doing because they were anti-war. So he put his life again on the line there and taking those supplies. So his, since then, basically it's the same kind of thing he's been doing. You know, he's always walking the walk, not just talking the talk. He's very much, you know, a leader in the theory, strategy, and tactics of nonviolent resistance, and started a database at Swarthmore College that's referred to by people around the world about how nonviolent resistance movements have won. And that's what he's going to talk about tonight. And it basically, the message is you got to be on the offense. So it's a real honor to have this guy who puts himself out there, his life and his uh, physical <laughs> health on the line, like. Oh. Wow, <laughs> I'm, I'm touched by your, your introduction. Hmm. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be introduced that way. It's an honor to see a bunch of you that actually I know from before. And it's an honor also to hear Carol's description of a road to empowerment that is really inspiring because power is central to the chance right of our gaining single-payer health care and I believe I'll, I'll make the assumption I won't argue this I'll just make the assumption that the more powerful we are the more of what we want will be available to us. Conversely, the less powerful we are, the smaller the amount of what we want is what we'll get. Let me illustrate. In Montgomery, Alabama, in 1955, black people found that the, uh, the racist bus system was a horrible thing, right? Now, if someone had said to them, well, Let's see if we can make a deal. Let's negotiate with the bus company. Let's, uh, that we're 50,000 people, so let's see what kind of deal we can negotiate. That kind of negotiation would, at best, have resulted in maybe one black bus driver on a route that went through the black neighborhoods. Not exactly <laughs> world-changing, right? Because it would be looking at the black population um, 
in relation to the white population as things were at the time. But black people didn't go that route. They said, let's generate power. Let's empower ourselves and generate power such that we could get what we want. Well, what they wanted, of course, was equal access to the bus system, right? So that white people could get on and sit wherever they wanted to on the bus. Very reasonable request from our point of view, but there had never been done. There's no way they could, give, could have gotten it by asking for it. There's no way they could have gotten it by lobbying the city council of Montgomery. They could only get it by generating power that forced the Montgomery bus system to be transformed. Now, there are a lot of people who will pretend to be wise about American politics, who act as if, in relation to single payer, it's 1955 in Montgomery, and we haven't yet acted. And they'll take a look at, yes, they'll take a look at opinion polls, but basically, they won't give very much <laughs> to the aspiration that we share here. Why should they? Because it's like 1955 before there's been a bus boycott in Montgomery. It's like 1955 before there's been an empowerment process that makes us a force to be reckoned with. And so they can tweak here, tweak there, but we'll get very little of what we want because we can only get what we want if we are powerful enough to demand it. And that is the story over and over and over of successful nonviolent direct action campaigns. Women declared in 1848 they wanted the right to vote. Decade after decade after decade, did they get it? No, 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 no. Not until they empowered themselves through nonviolent direct action, went after a target named Woodrow Wilson, name familiar to IU, I think, and uh, made his life so miserable at the White House gates and made such an ex incredibly disruptive scene through the nonviolent direct action they engaged in that they could demand and get women's suffrage. If they had not done that, if they'd politely requested or said, we're half the population, you have to do this, as if rationality is what governs the decisions of pol political figures, <laughs> we would still not have women's right to vote. We only get what we demand, and we only get what we demand powerfully. And so the story of empowerment that you describe, of putting yourself in situations of discomfort, <laughs> right? <laughs> And you admitted to being scared. I'm still, even though I've been arrested for low these many years, I'm still scared every time I am. It's going outside the comfort zone, doing the tough thing. And I'd like to talk some now about the collective journey, because you've talked about the individual journey. So the collective journey. Well, let me, uh, let me refer to 1993. You remember, that was the uh, Hillary Clinton presided upon, right? Healthcare reform effort. And this broad-based citizens coalition that was supposed to be making that happen was losing big time when I got the phone call. They asked me, a member of that coalition, a leader said, please come to Washington and consult with us because our chance to get a decent health care plan is going down the tubes. And as a last resort, we're willing to consider nonviolent direct action. So would you come down and tell us what to do? So, okay, I care about this very much. Uh, so I went down and uh, large group, labor union leadership, seniors leadership, uh, uh, the leadership of a lot of citizens' organizations, right? Liberal organizations of various kinds. No politicians, but the organizations that were a coalition pushing for this, right? And they were looking very sad. And I said, okay, well, uh, before I uh, start offering suggestions, I want to know who I'm talking to. So uh, let me just check, uh, where's the rebel energy in the room? Uh, please identify yourself 
if uh, you are abundant with rebel energy. I saw eyes staring at the ceiling. I saw eyes looking at the floor. I waited. And then someone said, well, ACT UP left the coalition three years ago. Oh, waited some more. Well, the people with disabilities, uh, they left the coalition, what was it, two years ago? And so on. They named the groups that were carrying the rebel energy in that coalition at the start that bailed because the probably tacit, probably unwritten consensus among the leadership was this will not be a, a, an expression of rebel energy. This campaign that we're doing is not going to be that kind of campaign. And the people with the rebel energy left, as they should, because why bother to sit around waiting till people tried to jawbone politicians into doing the right thing? I mean, politicians, if there's anybody who's expert in jawboning, <laughs> it's politicians, right? They know jawboning when they, when they hear it, when they see it. Why should that move them? It's power. It's power that moves them. And so those other groups had bailed. So I, noting these confessions, said, well, thank goodness there's still time I can catch a movie before I go back to Philadelphia. Because there's never been a successful campaign that has pushed as big an agenda as you have without rebel energy. And if this coalition can't hold on and cherish and honor its rebel energy, it's done anyway. And we're certainly not going to do a nonviolent direct action campaign at this late moment without rebel energy, because it cannot be done. So thank goodness, I love movies, actually. Um, and Washington always has a good selection, so um, I'm not going to waste my time. And ever since, I've been looking for a, a coalition of people who care deeply about health care who are willing to honor and support rebel energy, who understand that it's only by making ourselves powerful that we can get something substantial. And if we keep remaining relatively powerless, then we will not get what we want. I think some of you remember HCAN. I was very interested in throwing myself into the, 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 uh, the fight for health care at the time that uh, Obama entered the, the, uh, entered the office. And I'd thrown myself, as David said, into previous, uh, previous causes. So I investigated. I found out that the job of HCAN was to stamp out and, and, and make invisible and push out any sign of rebel energy that might show up at that time. They were intentionally, I don't think they, were, they understood it the way you, 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 know, you and I understand it right now, but the uh, impact of their work was to minimize the amount of possible effectiveness and power from a citizen's coalition. It was, it was a heartbreaking thing to see. Show up in meeting after meeting and see people marginalized who were bringing the power that would be necessary to make a, a, a public option, for example, possible, much less single payer. And as that movement continued uh, uh, to work, I watched then from a distance, because I had better things to do, in, in my opinion, um, to, I watched them uh, be so, uh, so unstrategic that they wouldn't even name an opponent. Some of you will remember this. They wouldn't even name who it was they were against. Now, it's a basic law of strategy. When you are campaigning for something, you name your opponent, and you engage your opponent, and you discredit your opponent. That's fundamental. We would never have heard the name of Dr. Martin Luther King <laughs> if he didn't know that. We wouldn't, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have women's suffrage if they, if they hadn't known that. 
It's fundamental. But that coalition would not do it. HCAN absolutely would not. Barack Obama was president of the United States at the time. He was kind of busy. He had a, an entire empire to manage, right? And he had many layers in the fire, right? So, of course, he wanted, he wanted a health bill. That was, that was what he wanted. But he wanted to be president at the same time and, and do the work of a president. Now, it's the job of the movement to do the movement's work. And it's the job of the president to do the president's work. But there were a lot of people in the movement who thought they ought to be led by the president. That the president should do two roles. He should be over here being president and over here being leader of the movement at the same time. It was embarrassing to have a movement, a social movement, be that, uh, that naive about how power works. So finally, Barack Obama bails them out by naming the private health insurance industry as the enemy. He finally did that. And when he did that, I felt on the one hand, well, at last it's been done, you know, because I've been, I've been embarrassed myself that it hadn't been done yet. But I was, uh, but then it was also, I just felt, I mean, he had a community organizing background, right? So he knew the basics. He'd read his Alinsky and so on. But I was just so embarrassed for, on HCAN's behalf, that they wouldn't do what needs to be the elementary thing of naming your opponent. Now, I think it's, it's conceivable to me, not knowing you very well, that you could make the same mistake that you could sally forth in this next year or two of a tremendous opening, the biggest opportunity that has been for major healthcare change uh, since that, that, uh, that time, 2009. And you might hold back also from naming your opponent, as far as I, can, as far as I know. Because it's, it's possible to imagine that somehow plausible rationality will carry the day as, as if this government makes its policy on the basis of rationality. As if politicians could care less about rationality. If they'd done that, they would have, they, we, we, we would have had, Harry Truman would have gotten his way in 1946, <laughs> right? We'd be catching up with the industrialized world. It's not a policy thing. It's a question of power. And it's only if we're willing to commit to being powerful that we're going to get what we want. Okay, so first of all, really important to commit to campaigning, doing nonviolent direct action campaigning, naming an opponent, whether that's a pharmaceutical firm that puts life, people's lives in danger because it ups the price of pharmacies, of, 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 a, of a medicine, or it's some other abuse. There's no lack of them, right? To, to, to grab one of those, run with it, and use that as an example in order to mobilize people. Now, would this be a new thing? This would be actually as old as the hills. Because as David pointed out, we've got that all over the place in, in our database of people taking something that is understandable, that doesn't require a book, but only is very, very clear, and then build the campaign around that. Do you remember that it was in Greensboro, 1960, February 1st, four students <laughs> went out of their, his, their dorm, right, and, and sat down at the lunch counter and asked for a cup of coffee and started a campaign for a cup of coffee as black students. They knew they'd have to go back and back and back and back. It was not a one-off demonstration. It was not an expression of opinion. It was the beginning of a campaign, and they stayed with it, right? But a historically black college a couple of counties away noticed they were doing that and thought, well, they can do that. We can do that. So then they tackled their lunch counter and another and another and another. And it became multiple, multiple campaigns. Very clear. Notice what a campaign is. A campaign is a sustained set of actions that target an opponent, that target somebody, some specific nameable thing, and, and expose an abuse expose an injustice and do it in such a sustained and sometimes escalated way that there's a good chance of winning. 
So this is not a dialogue. This is not speaking truth to power. That's not what the civil rights movement was about. It is speaking truth with power. That's what gets things done. And that's why the civil rights movement has to be understood as one of our major sources of guidance if this movement that you're involved with is going to win. Because that movement engaged in a, in a, in a process at a sim, in a similar way, in a similar situation as you do. That is to say, they had two major political parties that did not want what they wanted. Don Kennedy told Martin Luther King to his face, eyeball to eyeball, I do want what you want, but there's no way I'm going to take a step to make a civil rights bill possible for you. I am not going to take that step. That was the Democratic side, and the Republican side was offering nothing better. And the federal government was also attacking the civil rights movement through the, uh, the FBI. And the states were against, the, in the South, right? Against the civil rights movement. Governors, legislatures, and so on. The police. And the Ku Klux Klan, the most uh, developed and sustained terrorist organization our country has generated, was against the civil rights movement. An array of power that is mind-boggling was against that movement. And who won? The movement won. The movement won. We can learn a lot from that if we're feeling sometimes when we get up in the morning a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> I mean, if you feel overwhelmed sometimes, try being in 1963 or 1962, right? In the Deep South, wanting wanting racial uh, justice. How did they do it? Through campaigns. It could be as simple and as clear cut as asking for a cup of coffee or organizationally much more elaborate as doing a bus boycott and on and on and on. I don't have to tell you history that, that uh, is so accessible, but that willingness to start small and then build specific targeted campaigns inspires other people to do campaigns, inspires still other people to do campaigns, and you've got what we call a movement that makes John Kennedy sweat enough so that he has to get on the phone with the head of U.S. Steel right, the economic elite, get on the phone with others of the economic elite and say, okay, we have to give these people what they want. That's what empowerment looks like collectively. We've heard Carol talk about individual empowerment. That's what empowerment looks like collectively. This group, the group in this room, could start a campaign like that. It could start a highly dramatic campaign that would win through its drama and its integrity so much attention that it would attract to it way more people and in that way grow and escalate. You could do that. The, the current uh, organization that I'm part of started in a living room. Through nonviolent direct action, we grew to 13 states in five years. And we forced the seventh largest bank out of the, in, in the country out of financing mountaintop removal coal mining, which was very profitable at the time. In fact, it was the number one financier of mountaintop removal coal mining. A group in, in the living room did that by empowering itself systematically. So that's the invitation here. Okay, but is that, is that realistic? I mean, there are bound to be questions still. Like, is that really the way history works? And that's why the study of the Nordic countries reflected in my book is so important to me and why I'm running around, running around. I want to tell you, by the way, that in bookstores, when I talk about what the Nordic countries' healthcare system is like, you should see the bells. You know, you should see the, the eyes light up. You should it, it, it kind of tell what the bells ringing inside people are because they ask more questions about that. How did they get it? How did they get it? I've been, you know, Arizona, New Hampshire, Alaska, Georgia, all over the country, and that's what I find is a button that is more important than any other of the many things that the Nordic countries do. They, people coming to a bookstore care about health care. This is such a 
such a beautiful time for you. But what do they ask? They ask, well, how did they get it? <laughs> Practical Americans, right? How did they get it? And then I explained, well, they developed mass movement so strong that they could push the economic elite out of the way and get what they wanted. You'll say, what? That's possible? And that's when I tell the civil rights story again. Under way harder conditions than, I'm just guessing, I don't know you personally, but I'll bet way harder conditions than you've ever endured. Right? And they did it in our country. And they've done it in other countries. And it's possible. But what then becomes possible, uh, what becomes uh, it's highly predictable, is that the politicians will come to you. That is, the orientation we have from our civics books in seventh grade are that if we want something, we go to politicians and ask for it, right? We have been programmed. <laughs> that is our programming. You could probably name the teachers in your, in your middle school that told you that's the way things work. But, you know, things haven't exactly been working well that way, right? All right. So, so uh, we could, we could, uh, we could take another point of view, which is that that's not the way things actually work. Um, but instead, that we create power and then the politicians come to us. So some friends of mine tried that in Philadelphia not long ago. They thought, okay, we want to build a neighborhood-based insurrection against casino gambling. Philadelphia had been selected as the biggest city so far to foist casinos on. And uh, th so it, it, was in the, it was in the works, you know, it was kind of, you know, politicians were bought and so on, so that that would be happening. And my friend said, let's do an experiment. It, we'll do two parts of this experiment. Uh, the first part is that we will not go to the politicians. Now, keeping casinos out of a city does require the politicians to be involved, right? They have to create a policy and so on and so on. You have to get there sometime, but we won't go to them. Instead, and this is what they did, we will create so much power at the grassroots through nonviolent direct action that they will come to us. And then they, they made bets, kind of playful, you know, like, I think it'll be three months. No, I think it'll be two and a half months. No, I think they'll come out. You know, I think you guys are unrealistic. Four months. <laughs> Make a little bets. When will the politicians come to us? But sure, that's exactly what they did. They made drama. They mo organized people. And there were the politicians. How can we help? Because the job of politicians, this was not in the seventh grade civics textbook. Okay, okay, it's all right, it's all right. But what really happens in politics is that the job of polit politicians is to curry favor with the emerging movements so that they get a reputation as being uh, the champions of the people. And they will come to you. And that's exactly what happened. Not only did all the usual suspect politicians of the Democratic Party come to this Philadelphia campaign, but even the, even the state senator who had introduced the bill to have casinos in Philadelphia came to them and said, how can I help? <laughs> Meaning, how can I help you defeat my own bill? That's the nature of politicians. I'm not saying, you know, every single one. Of course, we, we have principled politicians. Thank goodness there was one on the screen tonight. I'm just saying, in general, let's make realistic expectations of politicians' behavior, how major parties work, and then, even though there's a role for advocacy with politicians, not believe that that's where we put, that's not the main basket that we put our eggs in. Because that has failed on single payer, that's failed in, on almost every issue I can think of as long as it's been the major instrumentality. Whereas nonviolent direct action has an amazing history of success. Make a fuss, the politicians will come to you. Why is that so important? That's so important because this, is, this country is entering a time of dramatic change on many fronts. 
So that there's a whole context here, right? This isn't just about any single issue. It's not only about uh, abuse of black people by police. It's not only about flushing public uh, schools down the toilet. It's not about the climate crisis and so on singly. It's about all these things coming to a surface at once. What that means, and there was reference to this earlier, is that we will get what we want in the context of many movements getting what they want. And so what actually needs to be built is a movement of movements such that the economic elite will be pushed out of the way and we can do what the Nordics did. Because what the Nordics realized was that the individual interests of the various interest groups were all being blocked by the same bunch of people. And Warren Buffett named that in 2002 to the New York Times. He admitted that the reporter asked him, what's this thing about class war that we hear, Mr. Buffett? And uh, Mr. Buffett said, well, there is class war. And my class, the rich, started it. And we're winning, said Warren Buffett. The New York Times printed that. Folks, this is way bigger than the, you know, any group's single issue. Because everybody, all the progressive causes are being blocked by people who, under, who understand only power. But the opportunity of empowerment, just as we see it in the face of Carol when she describes what her experience, personal experience of empowerment is, that is also the Nordic's experience of collective empowerment. Because when they empowered themselves through collective nonviolent direct action movements, they themselves, they transformed themselves and became the Nordic uh, countries that we like to visit today and that I like to wear the sweater of. Thanks very much. This has been a pleasure. Okay, everybody. Um, in a in a few minutes, we will have um, our speakers at the panel, and we w at the table as a panel, and. <clears throat> We will have people ask questions. But meanwhile, we have Dr. Hugh Foy to talk to you about some other things. Well, I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be amongst such company, not just the speakers, but the organizers, Sherry, David, Dr. Guyman, one of my heroes. Uh, Don Mitchell and David Loud, and of course, Mike McCormick, the, the professor of all professors for those of us who uh, get up at six in the morning on the weekends. Uh, as I was leaving the house, my wife said, got your checkbook? <laughs> so uh, this is the Gaibo portion of the evening, the get your checkbook out. Uh, we've all been there, but a movement like this doesn't run on just love and goodwill and good intentions, but it actually takes a little bit of cold hard cash to uh, get us down the road. It takes uh, more than that. It takes hours and hours, uh, weeks and years of dedication uh, by people like uh, my mentor and former senior partner, David McClanahan. I, I bring you I bring you news from the front lines. I, uh, Thank you. I'll, I'll be transparent. I, I'm a, I've been a general surgeon at Harborview for now, at least this stint for 27 years. And, and I see the tragedy that comes to people, not just to, in the wink of an eye, lose their health. Uh, but also their families. And I think of it, and as I walk in there uh, in the morning, particularly on the weekends, and I see the devastated, look, one, one thing you gotta be careful when you drive around there, because people are in such a state of horror and panic and shock when they come there to visit their injured or ill loved ones, uh, having received the worst 
phone call of their life in the middle of the night. The safety net that Dr. Guyman has so carefully outlined and chronicled in his book, Falling Through the Safety Net, among many others, is so threadbare, it's frightening. The system that we enjoy to catch us when we fall, whether it's our world-renowned Medic One, uh, or it's our safety net hospital, which are fewer and fewer and fewer as decades go by, run on such a thin, if not negative, margin, it is frightening. Uh, for all its problems, the Affordable Care Act actually helped sustain that safety net and keep it from collapsing, but I can guarantee you, having seen the numbers run, if the politicians do what they propose to do, healthcare in this country will collapse within months because it runs on no margin and there's nobody getting up to save it. So direct action, being dramatic, getting people's attention, bringing this to the forefront is important because nobody else is watching it. In the, during the holidays, you could not find an open hospital bed in all of the Puget Sound Basin. There was not an empty hospital bed in all of Puget Sound Basin. <laughs> they, they weren't there. Now there's buildings, oh Lord, there's beautiful buildings. And there's rooms, but they don't hire enough nurses to staff the rooms that they are appropriated to have. So the safety net is very threadbare, and it's only through organizations like this that we're going to be able to help turn this Titanic uh, as it lists to under our current leadership. So I just ask you, in your folders, there's an envelope, and if you could please find it in your hearts and in your pockets and your checkbooks to help sustain this organization, we'd be very grateful. You know, it doesn't have to, I'm not going to start at the $20,000 limit and make you feel guilty if you don't put up your hand next to your neighbor, you know, a dollar fifty cents or whatever. Look, look what uh, Mr. Sanders pulled off with just that concept. So whatever you feel in your hearts that you can spare, we'd sure appreciate it. And thank you very much for coming tonight. Whoa. Nice catch, Carol. Sherry. <laughs> I'd like to say my synchronized swimming skills helped somehow, but I'm not quite sure how. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Dr. Jim Squire is going to moderate the panel. And how, how did you want to have, do we have any microphones for people to come and speak at? How, do we, how are we doing this? Uh, it, can, can people hear? OK. Uh, it looks like there's no microphones on the side, so I think people just uh, stand Wait, up and. One. <laughs> Channel your rebel energy. So I can run this to anybody. Okay, so uh, I think um, maybe what we could do is have people can line up on either side uh, if they have questions. Um, I would request that um, people keep, uh, because we're, we're late on time here, uh, we can go over time. We don't actually have to be out of here until about 9.45. So we can actually go as long as people want to ask questions. Uh, I just request people make their questions or comments short, uh, about uh, 30 to 45 seconds or something like that. And uh, they can direct the uh, question to the whole panel or to a specific individual. And I'd also request uh, people um, who might be new to single payer or shy about asking questions to definitely uh, come forward with your questions because one of the weaknesses that we have, I know Carol talked about some of the weaknesses of PNHP, is that we're uh, very used to preaching to the choir 
and we want to get uh, new people to ask questions, um, and I think that's very important. So um, why don't we start uh, over on this side? Okay. Um, I have a question about uh, the effectiveness of certain political action. And I've heard these themes come up tonight in this conversation, and I want you to know that I've been a political activist my whole life. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I'm a dancer. So life has been different. But uh, I ended up with an illness, and that's how I got more and more involved in uh, working for health care for everyone, even though I've believed in it forever. Number one is if we control the narrative, which has been something that's been brought up, we need to control the narrative. If we create a proactive rather than a reactive movement, another issue that's been brought up, let's be proactive, let's stop reacting to them. Instead, let's present something ourselves. And if we want to humanize our opponent so that we're not just calling names and participating in the same gross politics and cruel politics that right now dominate our country, then what do you think <laughs> about the constant use of the metaphor of war, where we're all fighting one another about something. Metaphor has an incredible amount of impact on people's psychology. And I know that as an artist, having created incredible pieces of art for the stage. So what do, why do we keep using that metaphor and what do you think that, that, that metaphor, how that metaphor impacts all those other issues. Who wants to take that? Should I start? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a Quaker pacifist, <laughs> and therefore not into war. On the other hand, conflict is a basic force in human life. And I uh, actually agree with Gandhi. His view of conflict was that it was a positive when it's waged in particular ways because it enables people to become more creative and to evolve on a higher level so that there's a higher level of organization in which there's more justice. Or his, his favorite word was truth. That is that more truth comes out of waging struggle if the people engaged in the struggle are willing to fight with each other in a human way rather th and not in the way you're describing in which people reduce each other to, you know, whatever, uh, but instead acknowledge their humanity. So, for example, the organization I referred to that stopped the seventh bank, uh, seventh largest bank in the United States from doing this terrible thing, we never shouted names at the executives. We, we uh, dropped by his, uh, his house and engaged with him for an hour in his doorway uh, on July 4th. We figured he might not be at the office. <laughs> and uh, very civil, civil discussions. At the same time, we disrupted the operations of the bank and, and really hurt their brand because their brand was calculated to attract customers to them on the basis of their great responsibility. Well, how responsible is it to blow up mountains, double the cancer rates of people there, increase birth defects? Uh, I mean, that is, it, talk about, right? But, oh, we're your responsible bank, so you should be a, a depositor, right? So we had to, in order to advance the truth, we had to s expose constantly and spotlight their injustice and their violence. But we didn't have to, when we'd run into them, uh, we certainly didn't have to abuse them. Abuse is never justifiable, I don't think. Uh, so I, I'm very fine, on the other hand, with people being very honest with me in what they think about what I'm doing. Because I can learn from that. 
And I want to give that same respect to other people, especially grown-ups. You know, I, I, it's not like I want to deal that, that way with children. But with grown-ups, I want to say, you are doing something really terrible. And the consequences of your action are X, and you've got to stop doubling the cancer rates of people in Appalachia. You've got to stop that. You've got to stop that now. And that, that way of waging uh, conflict or struggle is okay in my book. I wouldn't call it the same as war, which is actually... Injury, you know what I mean? Yeah. Of work? Well, because we're not working together. No, they are working for profit, right? They are working for profit. They have a different goal. When they go to work, they have that goal. I have a different goal. So I'm not working with them at all. I'm actually working to undermine their ability to do their work because their work involves doubling the cancer rates of people in the Appalachia, and I want to undermine their capacity to be able to do that. You see what I mean? I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm working against them. Yeah. But for me, war has, uh, the reason I'm so opposed to war is it has to do with actual injury of others. And I'm not really into injury and death. I, I don't like that at all. <laughs> Hi. Okay, let's say I'll take one question here and then uh, do you have a question there? I do. Okay, so let's go here and then we'll go there and you can just speak up. I would like a, uh, to ask a, a favor. Would everybody under the age of 35 please stand up? Yay, Max. <laughs> Thank you, millennials. Thank you, millennials. That was... Um, kind of taking on the theme of Jim's preaching to the choir. I attended the Healthcare um, Now conference in New York. And one of the things that they said there is we have to engage millennials. Who do you think are the rebels right now in this room and in our cause? OK. I'm not trying to be insulting. What I'm trying to do is say, we have a lot of outreach to do. And it's not going to happen in this room. And it is going to be reaching out to our younger people and helping them become involved and talking to them. One of the things that I heard was at that conference, and I've heard a lot here, is initiatives never work. You can't do an initiative. We've been putting, or this group has been putting a bill to the state legislator, legislature for 20 years, and it has failed every year. We're trying to do that, and we're getting a lot of pushback, and we're not getting the coalition building. How do we do this? How do we tell them that we're here to build what you are talking about? We are here to help create the conflict. How do we get the older generation which I am one, because I'm 58 years old, to help bridge this gap and help embrace the rebels that are out there waiting to be tapped. Thank you. Well, I, I would just like to let everyone know that um, the Students for a National Health Program uh, component of PNHP is the fastest growing component of PNHP. We have over 40 uh, medical schools with SNAP chapters. Uh, I'm happy to say that in Tennessee, um, we have chapters in every medical school except um, sort of a fledgling one in at Meharry. And I just got an email today from a Meharry medical student that I met at the town hall a uh, couple of weeks ago asking me if I would help her um, go on a student outing to study the healthcare system in Cuba and my intention is to reply to her I will give you money to do that if you will get a snap chapter started at Meharry um, and I think we'll be able to negotiate that <laughs> so um, I agree with you it is a point well taken and one of the the one of the reasons I'm so keen on engaging medical students and undergraduates as well 
in this movement is because I don't want them to become tired, burned out, exhausted, mid-career and late-career physicians who have lost their, their way. Um, so it is a point well taken. I, I'd like to expand that question a little bit and not uh, uh, give up the thought that older people in 35 can make a big difference. Uh, look at Quentin Young, for instance, up to his late 80s. And I was asking George here uh, uh, about how he would, uh, as you probably know, in, in Iceland uh, several years ago, there was a, all women didn't go to work on a certain day. And it just brought that population to a standstill. It changed everything right now. Uh, now there's a woman prime minister of, of uh, Iceland. Uh, it just changed things now. Uh, so, George, what can you tell us about health care in this country and what uh, people of any age just about can do? Well, right, the women did such a dramatic thing, right? Because if you overlook women's work and then they don't show up for work, then you see the work that doesn't get done. <laughs> so uh, it was very smart. Um, uh, and, there, and there's uh, examples of medical people doing you know, equally dramatic things. I'm thinking about interns in California. I wish I could remember the city. Um, in, interns in a hospital uh, having a heal-in and announcing ahead of time, anybody you know who has an ailment or has something that, that they need addressed by a medical person, have them come next Wednesday <laughs> and then these interns admitted all these people to the hospital. The hospitals were full of, you know, corridors packed, <laughs> a closet, you know, every, the entire place was totally full of patients. Uh, and it was a very dramatic moment, right? Because, so it's an example of, we can have a statistic and it's very meaningful to us as an illustration of how how crazy the healthcare system is. And on the other hand, the statistic doesn't mean to people anything to people out there and therefore doesn't grow the movement in a way that say a strike or a heal in or something of that sort that's quite dramatic and visible and vivid uh, will do. And the point of that is not that that incident will then translate into shift, but that that, in, that thing will grow, will pro provides us the opportunity to grow. And we need a growing movement that does more and more of that kind of thing. And it's increasingly disruptive to the point where we can push the elite out of the way. I'd like to respond to that first. Uh, that's a huge problem, I think, and I've been very critical of my colleagues in organized medicine, uh, virtually in all specialties. Uh, in family medicine, I, I'm disgusted at what the American Academy of Family Physicians, which is a lot of people, do with their annual meeting. It's a pharma uh, uh, exercise with all the lobbyists, uh, pharmaceutical countries there. They even had a president for one year who was a single payer guy. He didn't get anything done. So uh, there is movement. 
Uh, the American Psychiatric Association is, is strong uh, on universal health care. The, uh, the oncology groups, some of the uh, oncology organizations have, have see the huge crisis in cancer care. They're becoming more active. Two months ago, the editor of the journal of AMA uh, actually in an editorial said he's for universal health care. That's the first time that's ever happened. They've been reactionary in the AMA since 1918. So I'm very critical of that, but you're right. 64%, I think, is the latest number of U.S. physicians or employees of, of employers that are usually expanding health uh, hospital systems. Uh, in California, a few years ago, an insurer, a big one down there, bought up 2,300 docs in primary care. I mean, so it's, it's a big problem, but I think physicians have to stand up, and there are ways, and, uh, and heal-ins are interesting. I, uh, some labor activity or unionization among physicians is a possibility. Uh, I don't know. Um, what do you think? Well, um, actually, I think that being part of a large organization gives you an advantage. You have so much more ability on a day-to-day -day basis to interact with your colleagues and influence them. I worked in a solo private practice and I, in a small community, uh, well, it was a large community, but I was the only private practice psychiatrist. So I, I often felt that I wasn't having as much of an impact or that I would have to do an action that was sort of bigger than it would have had to have been if I'd had more colleagues working in unison with me um, and doing it together. One of the things that I did do um, that was effective was um, I got a, uh, from a, a group called Farmed Out, I got a big sign that's a, a circle with an X through it and inside it said drug reps. And I put it on the front door of my office, and it truly meant that if a drug rep entered my office, they were trespassing. <laughs> and they were so upset by that that they went to Bob Conkle, Dr. Conkle, who was the inpatient psychiatrist at St. Mary's Hospital, and said to him, what do we have to do to get into Dr. Paris's office? And he just burst out laughing and said, <laughs> you haven't got a snowball's chance in hell. You might as well just give up. Um, on the bottom of every one of my bills that went out of my office, it was printed, Dr. Paris supports uh, a national health program. To learn more, go to www.pnhp.org. Every piece of paper that went out of my office had that statement on it. So I think that there are ways to do this. And I would actually say that being in a large group, um, I, I'm hard pressed to say anybody's going to lose their job because they speak in support of when, you know, take the high road. Um, I, I'm. I'm going to take a risk here and say I think that's more of an excuse than it is a reality. Um, and I can tell you that I got arrested twice and I was able to get my medical license renewed, my malpractice insurance renewed. Um, there wasn't a problem. Right. Good. Okay, one last question here. Wait, I got a question after the last one. <laughs> Yes, that is a philosophical debate whether coercion is 
nonviolent or not. Um, but I think uh, in the, certainly in the in the field of study, coercion is well understood to be um, co that coercion can be accomplished through violent pressure on people or through nonviolent pressure on people, and uh, people can nevertheless be coerced. That is to say, act against their will because they've been nonviolently forced to do so. Um, and uh, that's been, there's, there was even a book as early as 1923 by a sociologist called Nonviolent Coercion. Gandhi himself uh, said, let's face it, the British Empire is not in India as a good works project, you know, charitable enterprise. <laughs> it's a deadly, a deadly, he used the word deadly business proposition for them, and they need to be coerced out of our space. So uh, the preponderance of, of uh, thinking about nonviolent action is that what we're mainly about is coercing, that is to say, in the case of the bank, the bank wanted to keep making money on it, we forced them out of that business because when they added up the costs and you know benefits, they realized we better get this, uh, this group called Earthquaker Action Team, we better get them off our backs. <laughs> I'd like to make one comment related to uh, and parallel to, but I find it fascinating that now that the GOP bill has been pulled twice from the House without a vote and the Republican Party in Congress is totally spooked uh, and the AMA and the American Hospital Association are coming out, uh, we really need the ACA, the Affordable Care Act still here. Uh, but there's this battle about the ACA or the GOP bill, but they're really spooked in the whole medical and medical industrial complex and hospitals uh, about where will the patients be if either uh, um, Tom Price takes apart the ACA or the GOP things gets in and wipes out the safety net. But so where... So I think it's a great opportunity right now is what I'm saying because the, uh, the American Hospital Association wants its hospital beds filled and Medicare for All will do that. Uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of progressive organizations out there now and, and many new ones engendered by the Trump Republican threats and agenda. And there's always been a struggle between progressives about which organizations are gonna work for incremental changes that are quote considered possible and others that are working for what we really need which may be more difficult. So. We, I think, understand that we need a movement of movements, but how do we get these organizations that have a different strategy working together to really create a genuine movement of movements? Well, there's a common sense thing that I find sometimes effective in dialoguing with incrementalists, and that is to say, when, uh, is to agree with them that politics is the art of the possible and it's the art of compromise and that's how things actually work the sausage that gets made in Washington and so on is done through compromise but I asked the question is it better to compromise after you've struggled as hard as you can and gone as far as you can in your struggle or is it better to compromise in the beginning before you've struggled and what's really striking, even I hear, even Bernie Sanders is playing with this one, that it might be better to compromise first before you struggle. And that strikes me as a completely uncommonsensical approach. It, it's strategically, right? So I think in actual dialogue with people, we could just ask them, is, are you going to get farther if you compromise first? <laughs> or if you struggle and empower yourselves and then compromise at the end and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the whole idea of compromise is a political issue. We're not politicians. We are the movement. Yes. We are the people. Yes. So Margaret Flowers taught me a, a great acronym, ICU. It stands for independent, clear, and uncompromising. Yeah. That's what we need to be. We are not the politicians, we're the movement. We're the people and we're the power.
time? Okay. The public option is a terrible idea. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll explain why. It's a terrible idea because it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> and the reality is that when the public program competes with the for-profit insurance companies, I guarantee the public program is going to lose. And the reason is because the, the for-profit insurance companies know how to game the system and they've got all the money in the world to do it. They know how to cherry pick the healthiest people into their plan and lemon drop all the sick people into the public plan, which then fails because it's got all of the sick people in it. So a public option is a terrible idea. And I that would be I an totally example agree. of compromise for what? I, I mean, that's, thank you. It's a, a, a total uh, failure. It never would work, uh, though it sounds to some politically attractive, but no, it's, it would be terrible. I want to relate one thing that just happened in Iowa. Uh, there's a patient, a single patient uh, with a complicated genetic disorder whose expenses are a million dollars a month. and. And the, the dominant insurer in Iowa is Blue Cross Blue, Plan, uh, Blue Shield Plan, and it moved out of state right away. But along the line, uh, I understand, as I understand it, uh, it would take a risk pool of, this would have wiped out, that one patient would have wiped out a risk pool of 30,000 people. So the whole deal is get the hugest uh, risk pool you can, like 320 million. Could I just mention, I know we're headed toward closing, but I, I'll be at the table over there happy to sign books about the healthcare program and other aspects of the Nordic model. Okay, um, I would, um, will use my prerogative to ask the last question here. Um, one thing, you know, in, in the single payer movement, we sort of uh, are going for the whole enchilada. You know, we get, we want HR 676 or we want a state plan, so we're sort of, uh, you know, we want it all as soon as possible. And this is sort of directed to George, but the other panelists can, can talk also. Uh, you talked about being sort of more uh, specific and directive, like having a very specific campaign against a very specific uh, object or something that's objectionable. And when we were talking last night, you were talking about, well, how come like with the, the high prices of uh, pharmaceuticals, you don't like pick one of the hepatitis C uh, uh, drug companies and like target them and like make their life miserable and try to get a victory in in that way as as one way to build the movement instead of like going for everything so I was just wondering uh, you know it would be a different approach uh, as uh, uh, in terms of the organizing that we might do uh, uh, in, in PNHP so I was wondering uh, if Anybody here had any ideas of, of other things we could do that would be, I guess you could serve kind of incremental, um, but would help to build the movement, but it wouldn't be a uh, single payer in and of itself? My favorite one of that kind is the EpiPen because my life depends on it. <laughs> and uh, I want an EpiPen I can afford. And, and I, you know about jacking up the price and that kind of thing. Putting, putting people's lives in danger for greed. I mean, how, how obvious. Uh, the thing is, what most people need to, uh, to, uh, uh, to feel in their hearts in order to join our movement is things like that, things that are really, really vivid. I mean, it's, it's great for analysts to be able to draw a big picture and be abstract, but for building a movement, it's that cup of coffee. Now, people understood that when those students asked for a cup of coffee, I mean, some of them didn't even want didn't even like coffee, right? So they understood this, this was about racism. This was about freedom. In fact, the movement call, ended up calling itself the freedom movement. I am mean, talk about big picture, right? But they grew their movement through demanding cups of coffee. They grew their movement through saying, we want to be able to use the town's swimming pool. That is not incrementalism. That is movement building through targeting, th through demands that make vivid 
in local application, the larger systemic problem. And it just is some proportion of the population, I don't know what, 80% or something of the population, that are not systemic thinkers. I mean, most people are hit in the gut by something that is outrageous, like making people die because they can't afford an EpiPen. So the way to build the movement, therefore, is to go to people's, uh, you know, a place of vivid feeling and empathy and say, this matters. In fact, you probably have somebody in your extended family that is paying too much for medication or is choosing between paying the rent and paying for medicine or eating or paying for medicine. And you need to stand with us. That's called movement building. When we get a big enough movement, then we can... Be, make real. I'm not saying abandon the single payer, you know, goal as an overall goal any more than the freedom movement abandoned the goal of racial integration. But that each case point uh, then builds the movement to the point where we're powerful enough to get what we want. And so it, our power is the route to getting that vision, in my view. Okay, right now, there is so much upset in the general public that groups and actions are coming at all of us every day. In a way, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, that's what my um, email inbox and my email junk box look like every day. I don't know about you guys. We have to find a way to bring people together to cooperate on manageable actions that can be successful. That's what we've been talking about here tonight, is ideas for how we do it. We will need help from each one of you in the weeks and months ahead as we plan activities. So be sure that we have your contact information so that you can be included. Okay. I'm sure everybody's getting tired, but are you all fired up? Yes. Yeah. Ready to go do something? Yeah. Together? Yeah. Healthcare activism now. <laughs> Everybody in, nobody out. Medicare for all. Everybody in, nobody out. Medicare for all. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>